bacterian or dead animal carcasses. Vultures help to reduce the amount of decay and bacteria across the countryside. That way other animals don't come along and try to eat it because they could get sick or even die from it. I do have to have you seated in the front row, okay, before the birds come out. All right, because they'll think you're coming over here to grab them. Now, uh, we had two types of vultures here in the U.S. Uh, the only ones that we find out here on the West Coast, though, are the turkey vultures. Now that's because they have such a fantastic sense of smell, they're very easy to see. In fact, the turkey vulture can detect the gas coming off of a carcass from up to a half mile away. So when they're out looking for food, they're often in the air, circling, I'm sorry, just makes it easy to spot them. Now we also, uh, in the U.S., have black vultures. They're only found from about Arizona down to Florida. They don't like cold weather at all. Now uh, black vultures, like most birds in the world, have no sense of smell. So when they're out looking for food, they're often down in the ground, foraging around. Makes it a lot harder to see them. Well, you're gonna have an easy time seeing my black vulture. He is six years old, and his name is Gomez. Go for it, buddy. Can you see him better with the lights on? Yeah, you can. Now it's easy to see why they're called black vultures, all black except for the white stripes on the outer flight feather. Now what you can't quite see is how smart these birds are. Black vultures live in some very challenging environments, urban environments, big places like Atlanta, Orlando, Miami, where the fields keep getting smaller, parking lots keep getting bigger. These birds have to be more and more creative on how they find their foods. In fact, some black vultures have even learned how to gang up and attack animals that are sick or injured and help them to become vulture food a little bit faster. Um, it seems like Gomez is super tame. Well, he is. I wish it wasn't that way. But he was originally found as a baby bird in North Carolina. And I know the people that found him, jump up here. I know the people that found him, they wanted to help. But unfortunately, they thought they could do it themselves they decided to take him home until he was old enough to fly. Another mistake they made was hand feeding him. You see, whenever you hand raise a baby bird, it doesn't matter what kind of bird it is, it changes their programming on how they see the world. In this case, when he was finally old enough to fly off, he thought he needed to stick with humans. So he went right to the nearest park and started going from picnic table to picnic table asking people for food. Well, that's dangerous for both the bird and the people. So he got captured again, this time by game wardens. They took him to a proper raptor rehabilitation center. It's a really big one that's outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And those folks have a huge enclosure, just for vultures healing from injuries. Stay with me. They thought if they put Gomez in with those birds, he could learn to be wild again but it didn't work. He just cowered by the doorway until somebody finally came and got him out of there. That's when they realized that he was never going to survive on his own. So they sent him to me so that I could show you guys that vultures are not ugly and disgusting. They can be super smart, and again, they play that important role as nature's garbage man. Gomez is just not exactly sure what the routine is yet. It's only our second show in this building, and they're... They're still trying to get used to the idea there's a roof overhead, but you're okay, just stay with me, buddy. Come on, we're gonna walk you off. We're gonna walk you off, okay? There you go, that's easier. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Gomez. Good job, buddy. There you go. Now next, I wanna introduce you to a bird that was given to me by the first friend that I made when I moved to Las Vegas many years ago. And that was Siegfried and Roy. Now they had originally been given a pair of these eagles, but very quickly realized they had no falconry skills, no background in bird training. So they were happy when they met me so they could pass the birds along, let me train them and share them with other people. Now this is actually a smaller species of eagle than you might expect. She weighs less than seven pounds and has a wing step up and has a wingspan of a little bit more than oh five feet. God. Now her name is Sheba, and she is a bachelor eagle. Now actually she's one of only 20 bachelors here in the U.S. and there's only thought to be a few thousand of these birds left in the wilds of Africa. They're found in Tanzania, South Africa, Mozambique, and the Republic of Zimbabwe. 
In the wild, they eat a variety of things, including venomous snakes like cobras. That might be why bachelors have extra thick scales on the tops of their feet. That way, it helps make their feet a little bit resistant to snake bites. But uh, <laughs> battlers also have this very dense body design. It makes them a little bit shorter, but it also helps them to hit much higher speeds than other soaring types of eagles. Top speed for a bachelor in a dive is around 160 miles per hour. Now, that's not near as fast as the falcons, but bachelors are not using that dive to actually capture prey. What they do is they climb and they dive as they follow the landscape, covering more and more territory looking for things to eat. It's not unusual for a wild bachelor to cover up to 250 miles in a single day. Now, the coolest part about the way they fly is that as they're flying horizontal, this is even at cruise speed, about 40 miles an hour, they'll actually rock their wings very fast from side to side. It's how they compensate when they're moving fast through the wind. Now that motion also looks like a tightrope walker in a circus. And sometimes the birds will flip all the way over into a full barrel roll. Now all these behaviors is how they got the name bachelor. It's the French word for tumbler or acrobat. All right, kid, hold on. We're gonna use the big perch. We're not gonna use this one over here. We're, we're getting used to this floor. It's uh, very slippery. Kind of like doing the show on a hockey rink. All right, we're gonna let you fly over there. There you go. Now, bachelors are very aggressive birds by nature. This helps them in the wild with hunting snakes, but in captivity, makes them a little difficult to work with. You see, I do still have the male that I was given with her. His name is Sinbad, and he's also about 40 years old now. But every time we put the two together, Sheba tries to kill Sinbad, and then she tries to eat him. It's not a good breeding program, yeah. But we do keep them in side-by-side -side flight enclosures when they're both at home. And since bachelors can live to be into their early 50s, there's still a little bit of time. Maybe we can get these two together. For now, I'm just happy that she's willing to participate in my programs because that way I get to show people an unusual, exotic species of eagle. I know here in the U.S., especially in school, we learn about bald and golden eagles because that's what lives here in North America. But there are actually 60 different species of eagle on the planet, and unfortunately, more than half of them are now endangered. Oh, we always like to finish each routine with a big flight. How about a big one right to me? They all oh, there you go. Good job. I'll meet you halfway. Ladies and gentlemen, this again is Shiva, my bachelor eagle. All right, did you get the food? There you go. Look like you got stuck on your feet a little bit. All right, kiddo. And we're gonna set you right inside there. Good job, good job. You guys might have noticed that I do use the safety line on her. You know what, I use them on all the eagles because when we're in a small space like this, they can't really get up to speed. And if something went wrong, if she missed the glove or something spooked her and she headed like out through the door, the first thing she would do is hit the gas so she could get up to speed and then land somewhere and start looking for me. The problem is we're next to a street and a ride and a stage. And so this is a little bit safer just to make sure that she, uh, she doesn't go anywhere that that could hurt her. All right. Good job, good job. Let's ditch this somewhere. Right there is good. Now, next, ladies and gentlemen, I want to switch gears here. We're going to go from a uh, predatory bird to a prey species. Prey like to be out here in the open where they can see all around. And I've been working on the sound system, so hopefully this is going to be a, uh, a good presentation here. I think we fixed the problem from the first show. Can you come on out? There we go. Now this little bird's name is Ricky. Ricky is a yellow-naked Amazon parrot. This is the type of bird you would find in the rainforest of Central America. Ricky, however, was born in Los Angeles, and uh, she's actually the oldest bird I have with me today. She's turning 44 this year. Now this is also a type of bird that is known for their abilities to mimic sounds. And I'm gonna see if I can get her to say hello to everybody here. Hi, Rip Rip! Good morning. Good morning to you too. Can you tell everybody your name? Ricky! Ricky, there you go. Now I'm really glad Ricky could be in the show today. 
she wasn't feeling good last week. She had this really bad cough. <laughs> but I'm glad she's feeling better now. I think these treats are helping a lot. These are good. Oh, no. So you try to do that with your mouth full. That's kind right. of yum yum. Yum yum yum. <laughs> now, uh, before I get Ricky talking too much, we want to make sure that her voice is fully warmed up. And we're going to do that with some whistling exercises. Can you do some whistling for us? <laughs> what, whistle?
down comes a baby. No! Yes. And that's what happens. He falls. No! Yes, that's just how it goes. And fall. It's not the dog's fault. And fall. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to work more on that song when she gets over her canine PTSD, whatever it is. I know. I know. One more short song and then we'll have her say goodbye. So whenever you're ready. The other one. Bye bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Ricky. Good job, Rick. Good job. Good job. All right. You just have too much energy this show. I know. I know. I see your eyes getting all orange with energy there. All right. Just be nice. All right. <laughs> she does get excited when she sings and talks. That's why I have her sit on the stand. Sometimes she gets so excited and then she just bites the nearest thing and that's me. Uh, but you can tell what she's trying to do in the show. I don't, I don't know if you watch closely. She'll pull the microphone over so she can say the next thing in the show because she gets the reward by saying it in the microphone. So, little born performer there. All right. Next, ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring out a, uh, a type of bird I love. I love that I have as my part of my family because very few people get the chance to ever work with this type of bird. Now, uh, we are talking about one of the largest flying birds in the world, the Andean condors. Now, please don't mix these up with smaller California condors. I know those guys get a lot of attention in the news. But there are two types of condors, both endangered. It's just that the larger come from South America. Well, today you're going to meet the youngest of my five condors that live with me. Now, this young lady was originally born at the Buffalo Zoo in New York. And I was allowed to bring her home when she was just a few days old. And at that point, she was so small, she fit under my seat for the plane ride home. Well, she wouldn't even fit in a seat right now. She is 29 years old, weighs about 24 pounds, and has a wingspan of almost 10 feet. This is that same little baby bird, and her name is Vicky. There we go. Be careful on this floor. It's very slippery. Now, Andean condors are so big, they don't actually fly, fly the same as other types of birds. Their chest muscles simply aren't strong enough to pump these big wings and allow the birds to take off from level ground. So instead, they prefer to live up in the high mountains of Colombia, Peru, Chile, and Argentina. From altitudes of 10,000 feet or more, these birds can easily run and launch themselves like a big hang glider, and then they pretty well soar wherever they need to go. Now, since condors are the largest of the vulture family, the only place they need to go, don't fall, don't fall, is looking for that carrion. And the types of animals they find up in the Andes include goats and sheep, and even llamas. And now that the numbers of those animals are all on the rise, the chance for Andean condors to make a comeback is pretty good, but only if we continue helping them out through breeding and release. Well, I also want to show you how big this bird is. Let me see if I can get her to jump up here to my arm and I'll hold her up so you can see this wing spread. There we go. Now, condors do not use their, their uh, feet to grip with. Don't land in the water. There you go. I can tell she didn't have a very good positioning on my glove. They, oh, oh, she's going to go exploring. She's going to go exploring. There we go. <laughs> Unless you've been dead for a while, you're okay. All right. She's, she's wanted to see the rest of the building for a while here. There oh, wait, wait, wait. You can't go wandering around the fairground. She's going to walk right past you. She doesn't want me to take her back to the stage just yet. <laughs> Here, give me your face so I can leave you back. Just gonna walk right back. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't check the pockets for food, that's okay. Here, I'll, I'll guide you back, all right, all right. She's asking me to guide her back. She's stuck her feet in my glove here, so. There we go. Wait, are you walking or are you breaking? Here, this is our secret entrance. 
That's okay. That's okay. I know. You know, you know what it is? I think she really hates this floor. So I think she wants to head to the grass. But unfortunately, this is what they gave us. So you're going to go ahead and walk off, okay? There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, that is big. I yeah, she likes the actual ground underneath there. She doesn't like this condo on ice. Okay, okay. It's okay. But luckily, a long time ago, we worked out that if she ever gets into trouble, that's when she puts her pink in my glove. So I can get her away from traffic or broken glass or anything like that. And uh, once she realized she wasn't going to find grass on her own, then. Uh, I don't have to worry about her flying off into the carnival, bro. Like I said, not only are they too big to fly normally, but uh, as a performing bird, she is like She doesn't fly hardly at all. She just relaxes, hops on these birds, and gives them a little bit of at the end of the day. So. It's nice to be an education bird. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have one more bird I want to bring out for you guys. And he has been sitting here quietly waiting this bird. Buddy, come on out. She said he came my way. I wasn't ready. Yeah, this guy's name is Kurt. Now, Kurt is a blue and gold macaw. Now, this is the type of bird you would find in the rainforest from about Panama down through Colombia, Venezuela, and into northern Brazil. Kurt is 20 years old, and he was given to me three years ago by an elderly couple. They suddenly had to move into a smaller place that didn't allow pets. And I remember, I went out to their home late at night, help them out, pick up the bird, but I didn't want to keep them up late, so I didn't ask any questions about him. Well, a few days later at my house, I was walking past him, and suddenly he just gave me this really sweet hello. And I said, whoa, wait a minute, I didn't even know you could talk. And you know what he did? He just laughed at me. <laughs> that evil laugh, yeah, right there. I said, Kurt, that's all good stuff, buddy. Hey, can you say anything else? You can. I know you can laugh, yeah. Well, how about doing an impression? How about Ricky's favorite animal, a big dog? What's that? No, no, that's not a dog. You know what? That is the worst impression I've ever heard in my life. Uh, <laughs> and that ended Kurt's talking career like right there. Nah, I'm just kidding. You know what? Whenever you adopt a bird, you adopt whatever history they have. Well, Kurt's real job is helping me out with my condor conservation <laughs> efforts. You see, 33 years ago, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service sent me my first Andean condor. And ever since then, I've been doing anything I can to help condors out in any way that I can. One thing that I did was start a foundation called the Condor Fund. Now its mission is to raise a little extra money and direct that money to condor conservation efforts like at the Grand Canyon. Well, Kurt helps me out because at every show we get a few people who might want to come see a bird up close or maybe some that just want to help me to help condors and this is a fun way to do both. He's going to hang out on his box for a few minutes after the show, and on your way out, you can come on by, hold up a bill within his reach, he'll be glad to take them, and he puts them right into his box. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys for coming out to meet my birds. I hope you enjoyed it. Great, thank you. Great, thank you.